the productions that I've worked on that are that relate directly to the communities that I'm working in that touch the people around them are the ones that are the best supported um, so for me it's it's getting back to our roots finding um, finding our communities and finding ways new ways to reach out to them and show them that we can we can inspire them we can teach them we can um, entertain them um, in a language that they understand so um, I think uh the need for organizations, for institutions, to grab hold of individual artists as a institution building resource, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to an expense building resource, is a paradigm sh shift that we that, that's essential and and duh obvious. Um, it, unfortunately, we just completed a strategic plan, which I understand this morning was a really stupid exercise. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but as part of that stupid exercise, um, one of our primary objectives as an organization was the creation of extended artist residencies. And what we mean by that um, at the Alliance, and uh, the, the remarkable Terrell McCraney is really, uh, should be given all credit for this. Uh, when we premiered in the Red and Brown Water, uh, there was this crazy notion that perhaps the way that we could advance uh, a production by, at that point, uh, an, unknown, an unknown title and an unknown uh, writer was for the writer himself to go into the community and talk about uh, why that play mattered, what, what impassioned him to write it, and to connect our community to that play. That, that play, aside from just, just being a slamming good piece of theater, uh, broke box office records for us. And so, aha moment. We now are committed to extended artist residencies where artists are working for us, not just for the length of the project at hand, but they are our uh, community engagement catalyst. They are occasioning the dialogue that, that leads to audience, that leads to donor support, that leads to a sense of um, absolute essential placement in the community. And it, it actually, uh, for the managing directors in the room, ha has a really positive ROI. I don't even know what that stands for. Um, I think, uh, speaking from the artist standpoint, um, a lot of times the, the theaters that um, we tend to work in don't reflect the communities that they are in. And so um, as we progress forward and we talk about what if, what if the theater um, in a particular community actually reflected the people who live in that community. So the productions there spoke to the people who make up their, their audience base and their, the community that they're in. I think that's extremely important. When you say that, the, that theaters don't necessarily represent the communities, are you talking about um, ethnically and racially? Or are you talking about uh, many different ways? I'm talking about pretty much across the board. Um, there's, and I understand totally the need, and I'm sure Susan can speak to this as well, to, make, to put some butts in the seat. I get that. There's, there's money-making vehicles, and we all know what they are, because those are the plays that get done all the time. Um, but when, when you have um, a, a theater that is in a community that is primarily um, of color, and you're doing um, arsenic and old lace, <laughs> you're not talking to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I get that, you know, that's going to be a money maker for a certain amount, a certain number of people. But if, you're, if your uh, community is um, Latino, uh, black, and Somali, and uh, uh, GLBT, and you're not doing programming that speaks to those people, then you can't expect those people to support your theater, and you can't come and whine and complain about how the community doesn't come see your shows. You're not, you're not speaking to me. Um, so both you and Cricket have talked about, uh, about, well, Cricket talked about outreach, but I think you're talking about the same thing, about um, a theater being of the community um, and having conversations with the community. One of the things that came out of the study that we read that everybody hasn't gotten to read, but it'll be in American Theater Magazine. It'll come out in two weeks and um, pick it up at the newsstand. Um, or out of your mailboxes, is uh, this idea of 
Uh, well, there are two things that really struck me. One was the fact that many artists seem to believe that administrators made more money than they did. Um, and so the people who create the art um, that is sold by an organization don't get paid as much as the people who market the shows and raise the money, et cetera. Um, the thing that Susan just talked about, about Terrell basically doing outreach um, for his show, that was one of the ideas that somebody picked up on, that, that writers know why they wrote the show, show better than anybody else does. Um, and it seems like an interesting idea to me, this notion that artists begin to do work besides just the creation of the product um, or participating um, on stage, but instead begin to do administrative work for the theater. D does that seem like a fair way to talk about it or? I, 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 my only glitch is when, it, when it's categorized as administrative work. I think it's, um, it's communicative work, it is, it is work of engagement. We, we talked a little bit at a affinity group this morning about the fact that um, our, our art form uh, is deceptively democratic in appearance. Uh, anyone can do that, uh, whereas I watch a cellist and I know I can't, do you know? Um, I know I can't do that with paint. Um, and I, I say that as someone who works at a corporation, I never think I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Good on you. I, I, but we, we talked about the fact that um, making, making the process of creation more transparent to our community yes. might be the ultimate collaborative act. Do you know David Hull this morning talking about uh, the, the five C's? And, and yes, we are collaborative in our rehearsal spaces, in the creation of our work. But are we, are we collaborative and transparent in process with our community? And who better to be our, our guide, our uh, convener, and our, and our moderator in those conversations than the generating artists? And I think it is very much to the ultimate financial sustainability of the theater to thus deploy artists. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess administrative, I, I have right. um, horrific images of, you know, <laughs> light <laughs> filing. Um, <laughs> but that's, I mean, I'd agree with that. Like I, I, um, I work in theater because I'm passionate about theater. I love to talk about theater. I love to talk about the productions I'm working on. So use me. I'm there. I'm working at your theater. I'm working on this project because I care about the project. God knows I'm not making millions of dollars on the project. I'm there because I love the project. So I, if, if I'm given the opportunities to express that to the community, I might be able to reach out to a, a different part of the community that, that the playwright might not have been able to or the actor may not be able to and explain why it means so much to me, you know, from my perspective. So. Um. One of the things that's come up is about the sort of low response rate of people of color to the survey. And we're not really quite sure why that is. We're not sure what the percentage of folks were, of people of color were, who received the survey. Um, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that for all three of you. I know it's hard to make sense of it because we don't know all the information. But what does it say to you? Or what does it suggest? Well, I mean, the. The, the notion sometimes is that um, people of color aren't necessarily involved, like they don't want to be involved, or they're not um, um, as passionate about certain things, which is absolutely a falsehood. It's absolutely a falsehood. Um, but I guess what, what it suggests to me is um, uh, I'm not really sure where some of the um, data came from. Um, and I think Mark is, he, he's, he's absolutely genius in his, in his research. Um, and I think when we're talking about finding and representing and speaking to people of color, you have to include them in, in everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, what, it, what it suggests to me is, is that um, maybe some of the, the, um, the demographics or the, the organizations that were contacted about, you know, can we have your database, can we have your mailing list, didn't necessarily include organizations that specifically speak to artists of color. I, I went down the, I shall recall when we had our planning meeting, I went down the um, annoyingly Pollyannish route and <laughs> supposed that maybe the people of color were so busy working they couldn't fill out the survey. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
that got pretty much that response. Um, I, 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 I fear sometimes that all these years into this conversation, too many of us still di diversify our, our audience base and our, and our artist uh, employment episodically. Uh, you know, white play, white play, Black History Month, black play, white play, white play. Um, and it, it, it mortifies me that that might still uh, be perceived as, as true diversification as opposed to concurrent, rich, constant conversation. Uh, and the 86% um, raises the question for me of at what time of year did we ask this question, this set of questions, and, and just to be uh, baldly provocative, would the numbers have been different if we'd asked them in February? I, I don't really have. <laughs> I don't have anything to add beyond that. So <laughs> it, it was a number that stood out and startled me because I don't feel. I mean, from from the places I've worked, I don't feel like. Um, I would say that I work with 86% Caucasian people. I would have to say that I tend to work in more diverse situations, but I don't know if that's. Yeah. So I don't know why the survey yeah. would be so different. Well, coming so. from the other side of the fence, I can say yes, I work in an 86% Caucasian 86% of the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the issue might not just be about um, who was sent the survey, but about who gets hired yeah. Yeah. in theater in America in general. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so and the opportunities that are there to be hired. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I expected the response to be from the data was a lot of hand-wringing about the salaries of individual artists. Um, interestingly enough, that's not the response that any of you gave, either on the phone when we were planning this session or, um, or today. Um, and, uh, you know, some of what we've talked about is, again, you know, how does an organization hire artists to do more full work um, and, in the end, hopefully lead to, um, to better salaries? And in some of the research that we read, um, you know, it seems like one of the things that came out was um, maybe not a distrust, but a, a misunderstanding, or not a misunderstanding, a lack of understanding um, or agreement about the structure of organizations. Mm -hmm. So some artists, some individual artists said, um, I don't know why the people who run theaters make the decisions that they do about the way that the theater gets run. Um, and maybe it would make sense to us if we only knew. Um, is that something that you would advocate for? How do you think that that would work if artists were um, sort of included more in the way that the organizations are run? I, I think it, don't, it can only help um, foster a sense of trust. In one of the, um, the sessions, the multi-generational leaders of color session, um, uh, several people brought up an excellent point that um, there are no artists invited to board meetings. <laughs> there are no artists um, who who even know the staff at the theater, other than you know the the H the payroll person. And you know. um, so I think if if artists are included in the the Susan made an excellent point in the whole process so that there is a sense of transparency even if you have maybe two artists who sit on your board so that they see from beginning to end what happens over the season and a, a sense of transparency in the operating budget too I mean a lot of the times as an artist I feel slighted I feel like the last thought even though I'm the thing that's going to to make your 25 to 125 dollar ticket get sold. Um, I'm, I'm an afterthought when it comes to the money. So maybe if the, there was a sense of transparency about the, the operating budget and a couple of artists sitting on the board would not hurt. Or sitting into, in board meetings, I don't think it would be a, a bad idea. We need a board member of a theater company to come up and join this panel, yeah, I think. <laughs> and I'm totally serious. If one of you wants to volunteer, you should jump up. Anybody else want to respond to that? No, I mean, I, like for me, I think it also, as far as um, 
as far as like the budgets of the theater, having a better understanding of the overall scope would also help us understand why why our salaries are the way they are, why our, our budgets are the way they are, why we can't afford the extra sound system or the extra whatever. Um, being a part of that process, we, I think, I think chances are we aren't an overthought, an oversight or an uh, last thought, but because we aren't a part of the process, because we come in at the end of the process when, when the production is moving forward, as opposed to in the planning part, we feel like we're secondary to it. So. Um, so, Susan, as someone who runs a theater, um, tell us what we can do. So, you know, we can begin to invite artists to come to board meetings um, throughout the entire year, or maybe even join the board. That um, makes the way that a board is run a little different um, than it might be now, but probably not significantly different. What are other things that we can do? Because these all sound like things we can actually do fairly easily. Is, is it harder than it sounds? No, I don't think it is. I, I think um, the, the point of involvement and transparency is really well, well taken. Uh, when, this, when this research began, uh, before it got quantified, there were a series of anecdotal conversations that happened with individual artists across the country. And the, the recurring theme was, uh, I, I, I want, as an individual artist, I, I want to know more, I want to be present, I want to be invited to the table. And this is beyond the length of a project. And so something that we, that we experimented with uh, in Atlanta was the creation of something called the Atlanta Artist Lab. Because the realization is, whether, whether we're aware of it or not, as institutional leaders, we're present in a power dynamic that, that skews the conversation. And so what we tried to create, we have a venue. We offered a venue to Atlanta artists to come in and create work for themselves, by themselves, that they could then invite producers and artistic directors to come see so that we could see what they were excited about. And so rather than the conversation beginning with, I, I talk and you listen, we, we tried to create a venue where the artist could talk and we could listen. And it's, it's way nascent, so I can't point to it as, as remarkably um, efficacious yet. I, I can say that it was pretty remarkable last summer to attend the first workshop and find these um, self-produced works that were deeply generative and became part of our season planning conversation. So it's a thing one can do. Great. Um, the, again, when we had our conversation, one of the things that really struck me was that um, people like to, it seems to me, unlike the, the people in finance at Boeing, um, artists do what they want because they love it in a way that nobody really loves finance that I know. Um, and who processes <laughs> receipts. Um, and if organizations were to make a bigger uh, commitment to artists, does it mean that other artists get left out because there are only so many jobs for artists at theaters? I mean, it seems like, you know, actors and playwrights are popping up all the time. They're always turning 19 and starting a theater company. <laughs> I think that the model that, that is often first put out there is, is create an ensemble, create a company of artists who will do the work of your season. Uh, in the spirit of yes and, perhaps that's a great option, but the option of finding additional ways in which artists can uh, carry the message, be your advocates and diplomats in the community, that, that's additive. That doesn't reduce the number of positions, and hopefully, to Cricket's point, it, is, it makes a greater value proposition to your community that then engenders more resources to hire more artists. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's Q&A time. Um, so because this is being streamed, it's extremely important that people ask questions into the microphones. So there are folks on either end of the rooms with microphones. Um, I can't see you all that well because there's a light shining in my face, but if you raise your hand, somebody will come to you with a microphone. So I see a hand back there. Um, in the same way that um, 
regional or, or, or I should say main, more mainstream theater seeds the entertainment industry, which is you know a huge export for this country. I would, I would think that would be a, a, a way to sell theater, um, to your point, sell theater to America as something that actually you know, is a huge, you know, the, if it weren't for theater, Hollywood wouldn't have like this huge entertainment industry that goes from the, you know, movies to video games and all that. Um, but also to the point just recently made, I think small alternative community spaces, even bars, you know, that have little performance things going on, seed the larger theaters. So I'm, I'm just wondering if, you know, if could Hollywood, I don't really know how much Hollywood does or does not support theater, and and could Hollywood support? Could 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 that be a, a source of it, of revenue? And also, could bigger theaters support the little community spaces, if not financially, but just by paying more attention to what's going on in those places? Well, I mean, I I would definitely say I the majority of the way that I see Hollywood so supporting theater in any way is that the the film actors like to come play in the theater every once in a while and that will draw bigger audiences because they're a film actor um, but as far as uh, you know larger theaters um, supporting the smaller theaters things like a lab or opening up a rehearsal hall um, and allowing the the smaller theaters to work in there but I also think the larger theaters reaching out to the communities they should go into the bars and do a scene or a monologue or a moment from a play to to bring this audience in the bar that might not never go see might not ever see a play to look like look what we can do we can entertain you as well as the jukebox can so and one of the things we talked about in the planning session for this meeting was uh, cricket brought up an, a great point and a good idea in my opinion um, uh, of of theaters she said uh, some oftentimes she is booked for you know six gigs in the month from the month of September to October and August is absolutely dead there's nothing going on um, and and as an actor sometimes that happens as well and I think um, perhaps if it, it, to your point about can Hollywood I don't know about Hollywood you have to well but um, <laughs> <laughs> if if larger institutions um, followed a, an artist so that we're so that it's not always this competitive thing between the smaller theater and the larger theater. We're all doing, as Cricket pointed out when um, we were doing the planning session, everybody has their season at the same time. Um, and so you have a community of artists that are really, really busy for this amount of months and then there's nothing. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like dead wood for a period of time. So perhaps if, if say for example, Cricket is working um, at uh, the Goodman in, you know, yeah. I don't know, what? September, <laughs> and she's going to be there from September to uh, you know November, and then she's going somewhere else. If the Goodman then made it part of their um, planning while she's at at their space to to encourage audiences to follow that artist to the other space, so a more collaborative and cooperative environment between institutions ins instead of this very kind of competitive environment. Mm -hmm. So the Goodman mm -hmm. says, Cricket is also going to be at Steppenwolf and Cricket is also going to be at so and so and so and so and so and so. So there's a, a more um, collaborative effort. Yes. Maybe I've got eight artists on annual contracts to form their artistic collective, playwrights, designers, directors, and so Use some other theater as an example. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Rock Schulfer. <laughs> Luckily, that will not be streaming because he did not speak into a microphone. Uh, I don't know who has the next question. We have a question over here. Uh, I, as an immigrant on the digital landscape, I just looked up what the uh, Health and Human Services uh, poverty guidelines are, and the annual income is 22250 And it doesn't seem that these numbers are showing a great difference from that. Do you all have a response? Just from the data? I didn't catch it. Uh, basically, he's saying that you have the same, artists have the same median salaries as people who are poor, as the, the poverty <laughs> level. <laughs> Sounds about a, right. Do you have a response? <laughs> Sounds about right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, I think it's, it's the way that America values theater as an art form. You know, that, that we, they don't, I, I think the, the general 
public, not the theater going public, but the general public doesn't, doesn't understand why a ticket to your theater costs $50 when they can go to a movie for 10. They don't understand how much more we can provide than a movie. And I think, um, I think that's why we're always in the lowest category because they don't understand that we can be worth so much more and that we can provide so much more. Whereas a, a sports team can provide you know, two hours of entertainment or three hours of entertainment and that is worth spending money on, that is worth pouring millions of dollars into for a city. Why doesn't a theater, you know, why, why don't we provide the same value? So. I, I, I want to ask about, um, I see so many people here who are artists who make their living by working in administrative jobs at larger theaters. And so I'm, I'm wondering how theaters, especially big theaters, can sort of reach in to some of the people in your marketing department, your development department, your box office, who are making high quality professional work outside the larger theaters. And how can, how can theaters kind of really tap the resource of the artists who are working on your administrative staff? Um, Shout out to, to the nice Rock Schulfer. Uh, at, at the period of time when I was uh, on the staff of the Goodman Theater, the Goodman Theater had an arrangement whereby I could work as an independent freelance artist. My job would be protected. My benefits would continue. And this was a given of my employment. And I'm eternally grateful for that. We have time for one last question. and this lady has her hands up, but that woman has a microphone. I have a microphone. <laughs> you know, I, I just wanted to respond to what you said, because I think this conference would have been a tremendous opportunity, and I don't know if TCG invited uh, people from the entertainment industry, from the studios, to, uh, to be here with us, because really, um, you know, why are the Brits and Australians winning all the Academy Awards? This is the arena where we build the American talent and if every studio could take on one theater company in LA to support, this would really be a theater town. Right. Well, the woman who had the questions is clapping her hands and so I think that means, I think that means that we can end. Um, I want to thank all three of you for having a conversation with us today. Um, When you, when you finally get that American Theatre magazine, um, which um, we've all been talking about so much, one of the things that the article says is that um, the conversations that TCG has sponsored, the people have said that the conversations are so valuable to them, and that's something that can continue to happen without TCG um, coordinating them. And so I hope that, that you'll all continue to have those conversations as you go back to your homes. Um, because it's going to be awkward for them to leave and me to do the next introduction. Maybe the four of us together will, um, will do the next introduction. Um, and um, although really, I'll speak and they'll, I'll speak for them. Listen. Um, <laughs> so um, I, of course, want to um, thank our, our panelists. Um, and now I'm happy to introduce the what a festo um, of the afternoon. So Kristen, uh, Kristen Schumacher is a production stage manager at Del Arte International. And please join me in welcoming her as we hear her ideas. Um, thank you, Angel. Uh, thanks, guys, for staying on for moral support. I appreciate that. <laughs> Hi, folks. Um, so I'm going to bring you back to the future for a second. Um, awareness of neuroscience in our field is not new. Um, for those of you who heard David Hull this morning, he talked about human technology interface, and that's what my What If Esso has to do with. What if neuroscience in theater became a useful tool instead of a novelty? Um, last year also at the National Conference in Chicago, Jonah Lehrer talked to you all about attention and memory and um, how our brains are involved in those processes. For those of you who read Thomas Cott's uh, Digest, You've Caught Mail, in March he featured stories of robots in performance and also of a neuroscience research project which gathered data from dance audiences. So all of this work informs and draws upon a field called social neuroscience. Um, social neuroscience combines the psychology uh, of individual and group behavior with the brain's biological basis, the neuroscience, of social interaction. 
Social neuroscience is a rapidly developing science, but why does it matter to us? Well, David addressed this this morning. First, the availability of portable technologies is beginning to allow for studies of the brain outside of laboratory environments. Researchers can now formulate questions and design their research for experiments in the social world, real world application. Second, theater is a model social environment. Uh, neuroscientists have worked with individuals as they listen to music or watch film clips or uh, movies, um, but nowhere else do we get a live group of strangers voluntarily forming a group, the audience, with the expectation of being entertained or challenged by new stimuli, stimuli that, additionally, are crafted by live performers. This is huge. Finally, theater artists are experts in creating work to engage groups. Creation of new work, however, depends upon what moves the artist, since we have very little empirical evidence about what moves an audience or an audience member. New data on the audience's experience of performance will provide new avenues for creative work. By engaging in interdisciplinary partnerships between theater and social neuroscience, we can set the working model for the interaction between data-driven research on the one hand and the application of new technologies in creative communities. Get in on the ground floor. So my interest in this, I'm a stage and production manager and I've been with Del Arte since 2008. Um, but I also have a background and research experience in genetics, immunology, and social psychology. Um, so I see theater and neuroscience as connected at a basic level. Social neuroscientists and theater makers share interest in how people think and in how and why people respond to what they hear and see. In neuroscience, thinking and feeling are interrelated, uh, yet distinguishable processes called cognition and affect. Every time an audience settles and the house lights go down, people are preparing themselves to receive that information for cognitive and effective processing. Uh, I've been a facilitator of this experience, and now, uh, as of this year, I am also a researcher. It might be difficult to imagine the specific research questions that would benefit both theater artists and researchers. Um, what can we really learn in the field by listening to the electrical activity of the brain as it transforms sensory experience into meaning? The most useful technology for neuroscience in theater is electroencephalography. There's not a test on this later, don't worry. Okay. Um, EEG records real-time fluctuations in electrical activity on the surface of the brain. This activity is related, can be related to affective changes in emotional state. Um, when David was talking about brain waves this morning, this is how you see them. One current trend is to see this data as a next wave marketing tool, but theater offers greater opportunities for social neuroscience collaboration than any other medium, and we can do more. Affect, the experience of emotion, is a timely topic in social neuroscience and one in which we have a stake. Some of you may have come across the work of a social roboticist named Heather, Heather Knight. Heather has presented at TED conferences, um, and I spoke to her earlier this year after I heard about her robot stand-up comic. <laughs> Truly. Not only, so this robot adapts, adapts its joke-telling strategy based upon the audience response. You laughed, you liked it, I do something that's very similar to what I just did. Okay. Um, not only does the, audience ha the robot have to take in the audience's expressed effective response, laughter, clapping, booing, but it has to adapt constantly to keep the audience engaged. Think about how automatically human performers do this. Consciously, non-consciously, we know what it feels like, we know what the audience feels like when we're in the room with them, but we don't really know anything about it. This summer, using our resources at Del Arte and working in partnership with our local university, I'm starting interdisciplinary research addressing this question. Does electrical asymmetry in the prefrontal cortex as a predictor of positive affect occur during an individual audience member's experience of humor? <laughs> really, it's a very specific question, it has to be. But this data will accumulate this research over time to create a broader picture of the uh, neuropsychology the, and neurophysiology um, of the emotional response to performance. So if the technologies of social neuroscience can show this connection between effective states and the experience of live performance, 
This gives us a metric, a tool, to gauge part of the truly automatic emotional impact of performance. Theater demands attention, and we attend to performances, and our brains process this experience in, into cognitive understanding and effective feeling, moment by moment by moment, faster than we realize. Interdisciplinary partnerships between social neuroscience and theater artists will generate information in the form of data useful for furthering basic research. It will provoke new creative responses, and, and it will generate testable, culturally significant questions. I'd like to offer special thanks at this time to Del Arte and to Michael Fields for uh, stepping forward and supporting this work and not thinking it was crazy when I asked for time off to take a behavioral neuroscience class. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Wow, that was something. Um, okay, let's just take a breath because we're going to change gears here again and um, I'm really excited about this next talk and, and I also am really pleased that I have the opportunity to, to introduce our speaker who is Todd London who is really a beloved mind and spirit in our field and I think has affected so many people through his thinking and writing. Um, I want to tell you about some of Todd's credentials um, in case you don't know him. He's currently the artistic director of New Dramatists in New York and former managing editor. He was at TCG, former managing editor of American Theatre Magazine. He's the author of one of the most regularly talked about reports today, though it was written many years ago, The Artistic Home. I think he even coined a new term because it's so often now that you hear, even in the context of discussions like the one we just heard, people talk about wanting an artistic home. And I think Todd really discovered that. Um, it was published by TCG. And in addition to that, he's written, edited, and contributed to 11 books, including last year's Outrageous Fortune, which we talked about a bit a minute, a minute ago. In 2001, he accepted a special Tony honor on behalf of New Dramatists. In 2009, he received the inaugural Visionary Leadership Award from TCG. He also happens to be one of the people I've known the longest in the theater field. Um, I first met Todd causing trouble at the Woolly Mammoth in Washington, D.C. a long time ago. We were in our 20s or something. Um, in any event, I hope that um, you will join me in welcoming Todd. And I really, Todd, come on up. Look forward to hearing your, your comments. Hello, thank you. Do you need to stretch? Do you want to stand up for a minute? And just, because I, this is, I'm like the second one. Stretch, yeah, shake out, make some noise. Whoa, okay, good. Sit down. I just, um, I, before I launch into my, it is dark up here. Before I launch into my uh, remarks, I have to thank you guys for this last presentation. Mark Shugal, you actually made me cry, uh, which is strange to say that it takes a research guy to teach me about catharsis. But um, it, we've had this conversation for so many years. And for, to see TCG take this up um, is a profoundly gratifying relief. So I want to thank Teresa and Amelia Mark, I want to thank Susan Booth, who uh, made this part of her legacy as she was outgoing as uh, president of TCG. It's hugely important, and I really I want to stand here and talk about it, but I'm not here to talk about it. I'm here to talk about history, our shared history. So I'm going to do that. Um, my purpose is to talk up a revolution. Where there are rumblings already, I want to cheer them on. I intend to be incendiary and subversive, I shall probably hurt some people unintentionally. There are some I want to hurt. <laughs> I may as well confess right now my, the full extent of my animus. There are times when, confronted with the despicable behavior of people in the American theater, I feel like the lunatic Lear on the heath yelling, wanting to kill, 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 kill. <laughs> I didn't write that. I wish I had. It's the opening paragraph of Herbert Blau's 1964 manifesto, The Impossible Theater. 
Herbert Blau, if you don't know, was with Jules Irving, co-founder of the groundbreaking Actors Workshop in San Francisco, and very briefly, co-director of the Repertory Theater of Lincoln Center in its early days. Almost 50 years later, the full extent of his animus still shoots directly into your heart. You feel the roaring impatience of the original impulse, the crashing idealism that pulled you into theater in the first place. This is just one compelling voice from the fanatical chorus of American theater's uh, artistic mothers and fathers, not when they were running multi-million dollar institutions, but when they were kids with an attitude and a world to change. When Joseph Papp went toe to toe with a man named Moses in Central Park, when the Fitch handlers demanded an audience in the Capitol, when Robert Brustein stormed the ivy walls of Yale, when Julian Beck and Judith Molina insisted on paradise now, when Bill Ball tried to shake the earth in San Francisco. It's the cry of others, too, who dreamed with Blau of an impossible theater or an ideal, open, living, organic, immediate, national, federal, holy, public one. I want to steal from Blau and say that my purpose, too, is to talk up a revolution, but not the coming revolution, rather the one that happened over the course of the past century. I want to share with you some underlying principles of that revolution as I understand them and urge us as a community of leaders to reignite those principles, to accept their challenge. TCG has been my tribal home for exactly half of its 50 years, and so this anniversary feels familial and personal. My role today is that of self-anointed memory keeper, including of memories that aren't my own. Some of you are new here. Excuse me if I blow through the exposition. Some of you were present at the birth. Forgive me if I get it wrong. I am profoundly grateful to Teresa and TCG for letting me speak to you all. I am determined to arm this tribe for the future with the weapons and ideals of the past, particularly the ideals, because the revolution I want to talk up is a revolution of idealism. I've spent the past eight years collecting into a book what I think of as founding visions for the American theaters, for the American theater, manifestos, memoirs, letters, diaries, statements of purpose and desire, the words of theater pioneers as diverse as the Federal Theater Project's Hallie Flanagan, the Guthrie Theater's eponym Tyrone, and Ellen Stewart, La Mama of Us All. It's an anthology of those who have led the way, bohemians from Greenwich Village, builders of institutional theaters, fearless activists from Vermont, Vermont's bread and puppet to the living theater, wanderers of the earth. There are singular geniuses like Orson Welles and Charles Ludlam and collective geniuses such as the folks from the open theater and the young smarty pantses of Second City. For me, the project has been a search for inspiration and influence for impact. What is the lineage of our theater? Why do certain theaters exert a hold over our imaginations over time? How can the voices from a theater that lasted five or six or ten years, 70 or 80 years ago, make my blood burn when the theater I live in too often leaves me cold? Where is our sense of unique, passionate mission in a world of nearly identical mission statements, where we leave the articulation of vision to fundraisers and vet them in marketing departments? The book, which TCG will bring out next spring, is called An Ideal Theater, because it is about beginnings, and every theater begins as an ideal. Every theater begins in dream form. It's about an ideal of our capital T theater that I speak with you today, Rather, neither as an artistic director nor as a scholar, but somewhere in between. Amateur historian, sometime journalist, loving, engaged, occasionally enraged observer of the field in which I practice. I speak to you as someone who has been, as a collector of these founding visions, consorting with the dreamers of theaters. Their dream visions have possessed me. I want to pass their torch along, or at least use it to light a fire for us, to sit around for our precious time together. So I stand before you like a slightly creepy uncle who spends too much of his too solitary time logged on to genealogy websites. I come to this 50th anniversary meal 
clutching bent-up file folders sloppy with printouts and lists of names. I carry maybe a portable reel-to-reel -reel tape machine with something you have to hear. <laughs> what I want you to hear is the voices of the people who led to this day. What do they have to say to us now, 50 years on, as we ask ourselves, what if it were all different? Now, as we try to ready ourselves for an uncertain, if not terrifying, future. Here's what I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you that everything was better in the old days. I'm not going to tell you that we've got it all wrong. I'm not going to tell you that there are no visionaries in the theater today, or that our best impulses have, in some irretrievable way, been corrupted. Almost none of the theaters I will talk about are in this room, so I won't tell you how exceptional your theater is or mine. We just received the news of the present. This morning, David Hool brought us flashes from the future. I'm, I bring messages from our common history. I am here to tell you that our progenitors have handed us a ball of thread to find our way through this labyrinth, or better, a ball of wire, because there's current running through it, an electrical charge. Maybe you don't need recharging, but I do, constantly, so I hold tight. Revolutionary principle number one, the words of the Federal Theater Project's Hallie Flanagan, democracy speaks in many voices. In almost a decade of research, my biggest epiphany was this. The theater as we know it, the non-commercial, non-Broadway theater, began as an immigrant theater. Its first impulse was to celebrate cultural distinction while searching for a common tongue. Specifically, it began in a settlement house in Chicago's urban ghetto near the end of the 19th century. A house easily accessible, ample in space, hospitable and tolerant in spirit, situated in the midst of the large foreign colonies which so easily isolate themselves in American cities. This is how Jane Addams, Hull House Settlement House's founding guiding angel pictured it. Inspired by British social reformers in the London slums, Adams' utilitarian fervor, her belief in education, progressive reform, self-expression, and democracy led to the birth of the first American art theater. It led to other firsts as well, public baths, pools, and gymnasiums in Chicago, women's labor unions, local investigations of sanitation, tuberculosis, infant mortality, and cocaine trafficking, one more first. In 1931, Adams became the first American woman awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The Hull House Dramatic Association, or as it came to be known, the Hull House Players, made theater as part of making America. Starting in the 1890s, Hull House offered classes and staged plays, including some of the earliest American productions of Shaw, Ibsen, and Lady Gregory, to audiences of immigrants, clustered in the tenements surrounding the corner of Halstead and Polk, where the house stood. The Greeks put on Electra in classical Greek to, quote, show forth the glory of Greece to the ignorant Americans. <laughs> the Lithuanians, Poles, and other Russians staged their work in their own tongues, which, quote, kept alive their sense of participation in the great Russian Revolution and relieved their feelings in regard to it. At this crossroads, Hull House was a contradiction of identification and assimilation as the transplanted played out stories from their distant national identities and began to steep in the American melting pot. We make our world from the stories of different worlds. Multiculturalism, or whatever you call it, didn't begin in the 1980s, though we sometimes behave as if it did. Hull House reminds us that ethnic, racial and, racial, and cultural diversity is, in fact, our theater's foundation. Diversity was simply its originating premise. You've noticed I'm using the, word, art, the term art theater instead of nonprofit. Nonprofit, as a label, gained traction in the late 40s and took off in the 60s to distinguish us economically from Broadway. Art theater was our root name for half of the last century. Nonprofit is a marketplace distinction. Art is an aspiration. I want to go into the future with aspiration. Revolutionary principle number two from W.E.B. Du Bois. About us, 
by us, for us, near us. It's hardly a coincidence that one of the first visionaries to call for a theater for, by, about, and near a particular race of people was the man who wrote that, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. W.E.B. Du Bois was many things, sociologist, historian, novelist, cultural critic, political activist, founder, including of the NAACP. He was also a playwright. His plays, such as the sweeping pageant, The Star of Ethiopia, were designed to teach American blacks about their history and their connections to the African and pan-African world. He wrote to provoke thought among, among his people. He wrote protest drama to agitate in the white world, especially by revealing the Negro, quote, as a human feeling thing, connecting him to almost every event in American history. He wrote to stir white liberals to join the fight for equal opportunity. From his longtime perch as editor of the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis, Du Bois called for the formation of a Negro folk theater modeled on the Abbey Theater in Ireland, which would tell the story of the African-American people to the African-American people in one of their central communities, Harlem, New York City. If art would be for a people, it must be of them. If it would serve a community, it must be near that community. If it would truly be about us, those who form that us may be, must be its authors. Quote, thus it is the bounden duty of black America to begin this great work of the creation of beauty, the preservation of beauty, of the realization of beauty. The Krigwa Players Little Negro Theater grew out of a series of playwriting contests Du Bois sponsored, a way of supporting the development of the kind of dramatic writing he espoused. Krigwa Players ended almost as soon as it began, in part because of a dispute over prize money. Du Bois withheld from playwright Eulalie Spence um, in order to reimburse production expenses. Outrageous fortune indeed. Okay, I have to take a theater geek break for a fun fact. Eulalie Spence, the playwright without prize money, was also an actress and director, and later speech coach to a guy named Joseph Papp, helping scrub away his Brooklyn accent. Okay, back now. Du Bois Theater ended, but his call rang on. When in 1966, Douglas Turner Ward made the case for a permanent Negro repertory company to pre present plays relevant to the black experience, train black personnel for all areas of the theater, and cultivate what Ward dubbed, quote, a sufficient audience of other Negroes, he was echoing Du Bois. His appeal was answered by the Ford Foundation, and the Negro Ensemble Company was born. When El Teatro Campesino began in the migrant workers' camps of Delano, California in 1965, in the early days of the grape picker strike against the Di Giorgio Company and other growers, its founding was as local and culturally specific as one can be. It was theater of, by, and for farm workers. The stages were flatbed trucks parked in the middle of fields. The performers were young artists, amateurs, and the workers themselves. They, quote, rehearsed on the run and performed on the picket line, as founder Luis Valdez puts it, for a new American audience made up of Chicano migrant workers, Filipinos and Mexicans, some literate, some not, some bilingual, some speaking only Spanish. The stories were theirs, as were the struggles. One of America's bravest theaters, Free Southern Theater, founded in rural Jim Crow, Mississippi, sought to open up a repressive system that effectively refused blacks their own cultural reflection. That, quote, refused the Negro knowledge of himself. Started by civil rights activists Doris Derby, Gilbert Moses, and John O'Neill as an integrated company, it was by its very existence a blessing to some and a provocation to others. Free Southern performed at times under armed guard in parts of the South where gatherings of blacks were open to attack from the White Citizens Council or the theoretically legitimate authorities. Troop actors hid in fields while KKK members, alerted by the local sheriff, hunted them. The company manager carried a gun. Free Southern reminds us that even in recent America, 
We've had theater companies that thrived in a system of apartheid, like the Market Theater in Johannesburg, or under governmental sanction and threat, like the Belarus Free Theater today. What will we carry into the future? Can we carry their courage? About us, by us, for us, near us, Fargo, North Dakota, 1905, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 1918, rural Wisconsin, 1943, central Appalachia, 1975, the South Bronx, 1979, everywhere USA, 1935 to 1939. Who will tell our stories if we don't? Principle three for the revolution. The gifted amateur has possibilities which the professional may have lost. Susan Glassbell. We all begin as amateurs. So it has been for our theater. It was customary in the 19-teens, the first great boom of art theater in America, to recount that the word amateur comes from the French for love, the love of what we do. The Chicago Little Theater, the Neighborhood Playhouse, the Provincetown Players, the Washington Square Players were all passionately amateur in the beginning. Their beginning was directly ours. The Great Grandfather Theaters all began as amateurs too. Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Cleveland Playhouse, the Goodman in Chicago, Pasadena Playhouse. Life is worth play proclaimed the exultant George Cram Cook, known as Jig, who with his wife, Susan Glassbell, rallied their bohemian friends to form the short-lived Provincetown players. Provincetown became the spiritual godmother to every experimental theater after. A radical cabal of writers, free thinkers, politicos, and suffragists, suffragists summering together on Cape Cod, they spent a few nights writing, staging, and performing experimental plays. Maybe you know the story. A young man named O'Neill with a trunk of unproduced scripts. One night he reads, bound for Cardiff, aloud, and according to Glassbell, we knew what we were for. Maybe you know the scene, a shack on the Provincetown Wharf, the first ever production of O'Neill. Glassbell remembers. There was a fog, just as the script demanded, fog bell in the harbor. The tide was in, and it washed under us and around, spraying through the holes in the floor, giving us the rhythm and the flavor of the sea, while the big dying sailor talked to his friend of the life he had always wanted deep in the land. It is not merely figurative language to say the old wharf shook with applause. The people who had seen the plays and the people who gave them were adventurers together. In the amateur theater, we are connected, adventurers together, audience, writer, player, all one. Another theater geek pause. Some TCG lore. In 1961, Theater Communications Group was established by the Ford Foundation, or rather by W. McNeil Lowry, then vice president of Ford, and the nonprofit theater's first and greatest patron. Ford established TCG, quote, to improve cooperation among professional community and university theaters. Did you hear that? <laughs> community, university. Three years later, TCG decides under its chairman, Theodore Hoffman, its first chairman, to concentrate solely on the resident theaters with professional infrastructure, such as continuity of artistic and managing leadership. The bridges between amateur academic and professional theater that had linked this burgeoning field tumble down. In 67, TCG limits service to 13 theaters. Looking back now, one time executive director Joseph Ziegler writes in 1973, it is clear that what seemed to be synthesis was really homogenization. Yes, there was a model, and now there are many. We are 700 theaters strong. TCG has been reopening the family circle for a long time, a movement that exploded under Ben Cameron and now Teresa. Today, the Biltmore Bowl houses artists, managers, teachers, theaters whose pride themselves on professional standards and theaters devoted to community and even communitarian amateurism. Is there tension among us? Yes, of course. It's a tension bred, if not in our bones, then certainly in the early history of our clan. Revolutionary principle number four. 
The individual can achieve his fullest stature only through the identification of his own good with the good of his group, a group he must help to create. Harold Clerman. Sometimes the genius of a theater lives in an individual. Sometimes it lives in the group. If a theater's going to last, it better live in both. There may be great examples internationally of theaters thriving under visionary leadership of a single prominent artist. In the US, however, it rarely works that way. Consider the nascent mythic Steppenwolf ensemble, founded in rolling fashion by a high school student named Gary Sinise and his friends and friends' friends. They incubated in the basement of a suburban church and out popped a miracle of talent. Founders Sinise, Jeff Perry, and Terry Kinney, John Malkovich, Laurie Metcalf, Maura Harris, Alan Wilder, and soon Joan Allen and Glenn Headley. How does it happen? Or talent abundance of, uh, or the talent abundance of the Worcester Group, or the early acting companies of Arena Stage and the American Conservatory Theater. Unlike, for example, a great massive novel where the marvel is how capacious Melville or Tolstoy or George Eliot can be, the theater excites through the wonder of confluent gifts, powerful individuals tied to the whole shebang, as John Steinbeck put it. How does it happen that almost every major acting teacher of the late 20th century sprang from the group theater? Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, Robert Lewis, Sanford Meisner. How does it happen that an idea elaborated by a zealot named Her Harold Clerman in his crazy lofty lectures every Friday night from November to May, starting at 11.30 and ending in the wee hours, inspires 28 fanatics to offer their individual talents in the service of the most most unified, coherent, communal vision of theater that had yet been seen on this nation's stage. We must help one another find our common ground, Harold Clerman said of that 1930s company. We must build our house on it, arrange it as a swelling place for the whole family of decent humanity. How do a playwright and an ensemble, individual genius and group genius, find voice together? Clifford Odets, who made the group sing, writes his first entry in the group's daybook, its shared diary. I have begun to eat the flesh and blood of the group. I partake of these consecrated wafers with a clean heart and brain, and I believe, as I have wanted to believe for almost 10 years, in some person, idea, thing outside myself. The insistent love of self has died with strangulation in the night. I am passionate about this thing. <laughs> the group, as it turns out, was impossible to sustain. It was pulled apart in a decade by the very American tension between the individual and the group. And we, heirs to its heirs, have likewise been largely unable to sustain companies of any size. This is why Steppenwolf's fluid ongoing ensemble and the gargantuan acting company at Oregon Shakespeare Festival inspire hope. It's why a network of enduring experimental and community-based ensembles seems like magic. We are our theaters and we are our, audi our artists. Where is our swelling place for the whole of who we are? Revolutionary principle number six, theaters or institutions. Okay, that's not a revolutionary statement. This time the energy is in the question. The interrogative form holds the principle. It's not my question either, it's Zelda Fitchhandler's. Zelda Fitchhandler is, to my way of thinking, the great founding rabbi of the regional theater. She has, from nearly the beginning of Arena Stage in 1950, eloquently articulated and restlessly cross-examined the very field that she, as much as anyone, created. Her essays and speeches capture both the play of her own dazzling Talmudic mind and the aspirations and contradictions of the movement she pioneered. Hear her go. Separately and then together we forged these theaters, these instrumentalities, these constellations of activities, these collective outposts, these God forgive me institutions in order to preserve and recreate in new forms the art of theater then fusting in us unused. We found a better way of doing things. Found? 
We forged a better way. We scratched it out, hacked it, ripped it, tore it, yanked it, clawed it out of the resisting, unyielding, nose-thumbing environment. Let us now praise famous women. Margot Jones imagined the American regional theater into being. She laid out a vision for a nation of theaters, regional resident repertory, and she decreed what those theaters stood for, permanence, professionalism, and what she dubbed a, quote, violent dedication to new plays and playwrights. Thanks in large part to her and to Nina Vance at the Alley in Houston and to Zelda, we now have it. Tragically, Margot Jones did not live to see it. The woman call, uh, dubbed the Texas Tornado by Tennessee Williams died as she lived, surrounded by a ring of scripts on the floor, her ever-present drink near at hand. As I said, Zelda's my rabbi. She not only clawed the thing out, she asked all the right questions. She held her work, and so ours, to its highest standards. The regional resident repertory theater movement was, she tells us, quote, in its first birth cry, organizational. I do not mean to depreciate the artistic work that is done, she writes, when asked to consider in 1970 the future of the regional theater. Nor, on the other hand, do I mean to overpraise it, or to underrate the hazards or leaped, or to minimize the courage, talent, or initiative of any of us, because I think we moved mountains, or maybe even made them, and then moved them. <laughs> and surely, at any rate, organization is creation. I don't know about you, but I find this very helpful. She has pinpointed the special brilliance of the Triple R theater movement, and while she was not, in 1970, particularly sanguine about its future, she pointed the way to its survival, organizational energy. Thirteen years later, in a Boston Globe article from, uh, from 1983, Zelda founds, sounds even more self-critical. Quote, after 32 years of working, I come to this time when there should be an emergence, a flowering, and all I find is aesthetic retraction. That bothers me deeply. In that same article, we hear a similar concern from Gordon Davidson, another giant who founded LA's intimate Mark Taper Forum inside of what he depicted as, quote, an impressively regal setting that shouts out to the theater go goer that he is moving in the world of the establishment. Quote, I'm not sure if anything greater can come out of the regional theaters, Gordon worries. I'm not so tendentious as to suggest that these were Zelda and Gordon's final verdicts on the field they created. Their blazing careers have continued and continued to bear fruit. But I cher cherish their hunger to understand what they've wrought. I cherish their questions. What is the relationship between a theater and an institution? What does it mean to live in a culture whose great accomplishment to date is the building and maintenance of hundreds of instrumentalities that are shepherded by a generation or two of extraordinary managers? What does it say about our ingenuity that our administrators are so excellent and our artists so confused? What is taken away from that extraordinary fact if we say with the founders themselves that the art is in some ways still, to use Zelda's phrase, fusting in us, unused? If I had time, I'd add another revolutionary principle here. Honesty, self-criticism, dissent. We dishonor the ferocious efforts and truth devotion of our ancestors when we refuse to publicly acknowledge our own failures, when we bullshit our boards and funders, when we fail to speak bluntly to each other and avoid duking it out over matters of art and principle the way artists always have before my baby boom generation and the Reagan youth got so slick. Debate and conflict are that without which there is no theater, but we sanitize our conversations, just as for years we have a, as a field have pressurized TCG to keep opinion and criticism out of American theater magazine. If I had time, I'd urge us to eschew what playwright Richard Nelson once called the polite cruelty of the nonprofit theater. Give me Blau's murderous rant any day. Give me Andre Gregory's statement from the late 60s after he'd been kicked out of his second regional theater by a second board of directors and said, I'm scared that the regional theater by the time it is mature will have bored the shit out of millions of people all over the country. At least then we know what we're dealing with. 
Give me Zelda's question. One more revolutionary principle from Julian Beck with examples by Joseph Papp. Number seven, you must enter the theater through the world. We need heroics, at least I do. They pump us up, encourage our little selves towards magnificent, the, it, magnificence. They urge us to action. Almost every political theater in America offers such incitement. The Living Theater, San Francisco Mime Troupe, El Teatro Campesino, and Free Southern, as we've seen. I've chosen as one final hero, an easy one, a political man who founded a thriving populist theater in a most elitist city. I'll keep it brief, since you probably know it. The tale of Colossus Joe Papp and his New York Shakespeare Festival and public theater is a story of many stories. How a little known stage, uh, television stage manager and a young theater producer of unshakable principle faced down the House Un-American Activities Committee. How this same man, blacklisted, fought in court to keep his job at CBS and won. How to offer Shakespeare at no cost to the people of New York City, he bested Robert Moses, one of the giants of 20th century New York politics, how he built up free theater for all in Central Park, how he unilaterally established colorblind multiracial casting, how he made a mainstream home for an eclectic array of work by writers of color, Entisaki Shange's For Colored Girls, Charles Gordon's Pulitzer Prize winning No Place to Be Somebody, Miguel Pinero's Short Eyes, and his successor, George C. Wolfe's The Colored Museum. How he refused money from the NEA after an obscenity clause was inserted into its grant contract. How a poor boy from Brooklyn, Yusel Paparovsky, whose parents spoke Yiddish, fell in love with Shakespeare at the public library and then set out to make a theater in the image of that library, free for all. How that poor boy became argu arguably the most influential American producer in history, produced over 450 plays, including the entire canon of Shakespeare, minus one, and did more, it's been said, than any single individual, quote, to widen the base of the American theater audience. If there is a single driving force which characterizes the New York Shakespeare Festival, Papp said, it is its continual confrontation with the wall that separates vast numbers of people from the arts, a wall spawned by poverty, ignorance, historical condition. You must enter the theater through the world, and everyone who enters your theater enters through the world. According to historian Mary Henderson, Papp's manifesto is one simple, direct, and unwavering statement. Everybody needs theater. Okay, I lied. One more revolutionary principle. <laughs> but this one needs no explanation. This principle runs through the literature of our genesis. It might be the most challenging to our worldwide pragmatic quantitative age. Principle the last, which is also the first, from Sheldon Cheney, who founded Theater Arts Magazine in 1916. Idealism may itself be put down as the first ideal of the art theater. Some years ago at a TCG conference, I attended a session on stress and burnout. It was led by a research psychologist named Robert Maurer. Maurer's premise was simple. The symptoms of stress are fear-related. They are fight or flight symptoms. Stress is fear. Fear constricts breath, and its opposite is inspiration, which literally means drawing air into the lungs. We should learn from children and animals, he told us. When they feel fear, they reach out for comfort. They reach out for inspiration. They reach out to their mothers and fathers. We are all the daughters of our mother and father's house and all the brothers, to paraphrase Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's Viola. And we are stewards of that house, stewards of the principles built into the foundation. We are stewards of their fanaticism and idealism, their love of play, their devotion to making a world from all its stories. We carry their questions and courage. If we live in a time of fear for the form of theater itself, and I think we do, we have each other to reach to for comfort and inspiration, and we have them breathe in. We are such a young field, babes in the woods. There is no path before us but the one we'll cut. We are, though, holding a ball of thread or maybe a ball of wire to help us through. 
There's current in the wire. Hold tight. Thank you. I think Todd gave us that inspiration we needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. All right, we have, as we move forward, one more What a Festo this afternoon. And I'd like to invite Larissa Fastors up to the stage. Come on. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Larissa Fasthorse. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Um, I'm a playwright and a choreographer. And as you see, my topic is what if being a Native American female playwright were no longer exotic? Um, <laughs> being that I'm all three of those things, number one, I wouldn't be up here. So yay for the status quo. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> hmm, but looking to the future. Um, it sounds simple, right? Like, what does that world mean for the theater? In fact, you know what, let's all forget about the female issue, because there's a lot of people talking about that right now. In order to make a Native American playwright no, more, no longer exotic in the theater world, I do believe there are lines that we have to cross on both sides. See, the condition of being a Native American in this country, of being a sovereign nation living within a dominant nation, means us that we can constantly redefine our fluid political borders. So we want to all preserve our own cultures within the dominant culture, but we also want to be treated as equals. We want to have our cake and eat it too, which we totally deserve, right? I mean, put in any marginalized group in that place of Native American female, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. So in my case, for instance, I want people to judge me by my work. And that work has various tribal themes and characters born of my unique perspective. It is an experience that a very small minority of the people on this entire planet have had. And I enjoy sharing it with people. And I have the right to share it. It also happens, though, to be a culture that ignites a particular passion in people. It, uh, you know, feathers, horses, teepees. They're all very cool things, right? <laughs> However, I uh, actually rarely write about any of them. But then, considering that, how is it that I'm going to stay Lakota as a writer and not exotic at the same time? As I see it, there are two choices. Either one, I stop writing about Indians altogether, we'll get to that later, or there have to be so many productions of culturally specific work that Native American is as ordinary as a white male playwright on Broadway. Which may be pushing it, I know, and I hear all your well-meaning protests already. So, Let's run through a, a couple of the common protests that I personally have come across in my short career. We'll start with an easy one. Larissa, there just aren't any Native American female writers to produce. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm the co-chair of the new Los Angeles Native Women Writers Group. And <laughs> along with Laura Seamus, who's back here, and Carolyn Dunn, an excellent playwright who's not here because she's busy doing the work. Um, but anyway, we uh, put our heads together and we came up with 30 working native female, female writers here in Los Angeles. That was just off the top of our heads, people we already knew. And that's only in Los Angeles. And in fact, at Native Voices at the Autry, who is our host uh, for our group, they are the country's leading producer of new Native American plays. They get far more submissions from female Native American writers than male. I'm here. I'm not alone. So let's move on. Well, Larissa, there aren't any good native female writers. <laughs> Ow. Okay, um, that may be true, actually, all right? But that's on us writers. And that's something that we all have to get real about and we have to be honest with each other about. In Los Angeles, only 20% of the produced theater work is by women at all, of any ethnicity. A lot of people are upset about, by that, which I totally get. But as an individual writer, that doesn't freak me out. It just tells me that I've got to be good. I've got to be very good. And I'm aiming to be in the top percent of all work produced anyway. So the one thing I do ask, though, if I do my work, that I want to be considered on an equal playing field where I only have to be as good as the next guy to get my work seen. This next one, 
It's a personal favorite. I've heard it again and again. Larissa, we like your work. But we just can't cast Native American. We don't have any. I did hear this once by uh, an artistic director who lives in the middle of the largest Indian population in the country. <laughs> just saying. So sometimes that means it's a matter of casting a wider net, of looking at other ways of reaching out to your community, which we've been talking a lot about, other ways of finding out who those artists are that are all around you right now. But I do acknowledge that sometimes, you know what, it's, it's true. You know, you may have a theater level that does not, but, you know, supports a certain level of professionalism, which I hope I'm working with, and you do not have the resources of Native American actors in your community to work with. I get that, right? So I say, go back to this particular artistic director, and I said, okay, you know what, I'm fine. I'm okay with you using other actors to play Native Americans. After all, if Native Americans want to be cast colorblind, allowed to play any role, it has to go both ways, right? So, the artistic director then turns to me and says, ooh, Larissa, we're really not comfortable with that. <laughs> Hold it. Okay, so you are comfortable with not doing work by any writers, native or not, that have any native characters in them at all. You are fine with intentionally blocking an entire ethnicity from your stage for your casting comfort. I'm sorry, but you theaters do have to get less comfortable. Finally, for Native American not to be exotic, perhaps nothing's exotic. Not because there are so many cultural specific plays produced, but because of pan-cultural identity. It's a very dangerous trend I'm seeing of watering down culture to make it universal and therefore palatable to your general audiences. In my opinion, it creates immunity to differences, immunity to cultural specifics, and immunity to strange people in different lands that exist right here within our own country. And it has to stop. And Native American writers do have to start the education. In fact, let's just start right now. There is no Native American culture. I know, I've been saying it this last four and a half minutes, but we are over 500 individual tribes of people, just like Europe or Africa. We get the concept there, but for some reason we don't understand it here in the United States. These are all very different people with different languages, different cultures that really have no relationship to each other except geography. I am, per, by chance, Lakota. It's a specific language and a culture that is shared by no one else on this entire planet. Audiences do not need to become immune to that fact. They need to see a very specific Lakota character on stage so that we can all identify our shared humanity in her. That character trait is as palatable and as ordinary as it's going to get. So in the end, does being exotic give me an advantage? Did August Wilson say, hey, you know what, forget these black folks. I want to write about white guys in Cleveland. Hell no. But there are some very strong advantages to my world and the culture I was born into. And I've been blessed with opportunities to work with inspiring companies and funders that are willing to risk, take a risk on producing something that they do not have all the answers to. So yes, I do like being exotic. But exotic tends to go along with rare or endangered, and I cannot pay the bills on that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Paula Tomai, and I'm the Managing Director at South Coast Repertory, and I have the distinct pleasure of presenting this year's Regional Funder Award, which recognizes a local funding organization that has evidenced leadership and provided outstanding sustained support of theaters in the region where the conference is being held. The James Irvine Foundation is a private, nonprofit grant-making foundation dedicated to expanding opportunity for the people of California to participate in a vibrant, successful, and inclusive society. The foundation's grant-making focuses on three areas, arts, California democracy, and youth. Since 1937, the foundation has provided over $1 billion in grants to more than 3,000 nonprofit organizations throughout the state. With $1.5 billion in assets, the foundation made grants of $65 million in 2010 for the people of California. 
And of that 65 million, 18 million supported the arts in the form of 110 grants. In short, the foundation has played a remarkable and consistent role in responding to the needs and opportunities of the arts in California. To accept the 2011 Regional Funder Award, please join me in welcoming the Senior Program Officer for the Arts at the James Irvine Foundation, Ted Russell. Thanks, you guys. Wow. All right, all right, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Crazy theater people. I love it. All right. It's really an incredible honor to be here. So, Paula, thank you. Teresa, everyone here with TCG, I want to send out a major thanks to the whole industry here. I'm honored to be here representing the foundation, our board, our president and CEO, Jim Canales, who's up in San Francisco right now. It's an incredible honor given our tradition. The Irvine Foundation has been making grants for over 70 years. Our first grant was an arts grant, and we're going to keep deeply committed to that tradition. We're going to be announcing a new art strategy on the 27th of this month, but I can't speak about that right now. <laughs> But what I really want to do is extend a heartfelt thanks to the folks who actually make this possible for our foundation to be considered a leader in this region. And really what that's all about is the grantees. So incredible people all sitting here, incredible theater companies. If you look on our website right now, you'll see the Irvine Quarterly Newsletter. It's a quarterly newsletter we call the IQ because we're really clever. Irvine <laughs> Quarterly IQ, yeah. Foundation people, we think we're so smart, yeah. But if you look in that newsletter, you'll see an article about Cornerstone, Cornerstone Theater Company, which we consider to be a model of community arts engagement. So we put them forward as a model for others to read about in the newsletter. Here in LA, we support a lot of incredible groups. I can't even consider naming all the groups that we have supported, that we even have grants for right now, but great groups like the Roby Theater Company, Deaf West Theater, Latino Theater Company, Radar LA. I mean, these are the kind of groups we support just here in Los Angeles. You're welcome. You are welcome. So we never get to do this face to face. I love that. All right. Up back in San Francisco in the Bay Area, we support incredible groups. Cal Shakes. Uh, we support folks like the Lorraine Hansberry Theater, Shotgun Players, African American Shakespeare Company, groups who we do our best as foundation folk to get out and see, but we know they're doing great work all the time, not just when we show up. So you don't actually have to do a whole big song and dance when we show up because we know the great work's happening all the time. We believe in these groups that are doing this. And it's not just in these two big arts capitals, Los Angeles and San Francisco. The James Irvine Foundation is dedicated to creating opportunity for folks all across the state of California, opportunities for them to see and experience great art, great theater. So for example, in Sacramento, you have Capitol Stage. You have just up the road in Ventura Rubicon. You have all the way up in the foothills, Sierra Repertory Theater. Love those guys up in the foothills, Sierra Rep. Okay, if you go um, down to San Diego, we have folks like Diversionary Theater, Signet Theater. I mean, they are all over the state, all the way up to where Del Arte is, all the way at the far reaches. And we support all of these groups with grants that are aligned with our vision, but it's really about their work. So I really want to extend a major thank you to all the groups. I had a really exciting moment here because this is really cool actually to have the in-person thing. It's weird. You know, we have an office, we have a, you know, we don't have a tower. We're in a tower. We just have a couple floors. But we're up on the 34th floor in Market Street in San Francisco and we only get out every so often because we're in there with all our paperwork and computers and stuff. But this face-to-face -face thing is really cool. <laughs> All right, because I had an incredible experience yesterday. Thank you. I had an incredible experience yesterday for the first time at a conference. I was here at TCG, and the Irvine board was back at headquarters having their June meeting, considering the docket, and they're absolutely great people from all over the state. But they were considering some really incredible responsibilities, some grants we had been working on for a long time. And one of those included a million dollar grant for Berkeley Rep that we had been working on. <laughs> We have been working on since January. So how excited was I to be able to talk to Susie Medic right here face to face and say, yes, 
we did the right thing. We're supporting your incredibly innovative work. They're going to do a really cool artist residency program. I'm not going to be the one to tell you about it. We'll let you tell you to them tell you about it. But it was really exciting. It's the first time I've actually, instead of picking up the phone and saying, yeah, you got a grant, da da da, got to do it face to face. Really incredible conference. We support other great groups. And this is the point is, if we are a leader, it's because of the work of these grantees. Berkeley Rep is the innovator. So if we're a leader, it's kind of by transference that somehow by supporting the right groups, we actually become the leader. So in that Arts Innovation Fund, we support some really visionary theaters. ACT, the Old Globe Theater, La Jolla Playhouse, and just you know half a mile from here, Center Theater Group, CTG. And if there's one thing I should really do, I should take just one quick moment. I don't want to get between people and their coffee. That's the last thing I want to do. But one quick thing is a heartfelt personal thanks to CTG because my papa son, dearly departed, was a mechanical engineer. And for about 25 years, he worked across the street from CTG. And really frequently, he would take mom and me, and we'd go over, have a big night at the theater, and at the Amundsen, and at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, we just had incredible nights of magic, and we always left transformed from those experiences. And I know it changed me. I know it's changed a lot of people. So thank you, Gordon, for being here and, and coming back. But most of all, I just want to talk to you about what this work does. And so to say thanks for the James Irvine Foundation, I actually would be remiss not to thank all the great theater makers here from all across the country, even though we only fund here in the state. The work you do is incredible. The transformations that you provide people, everyday people, are really important. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. people running out. There are a couple of announcements before you go, though. Um, first of all, kind of following up on Todd's wonderful talk, I wanted to let you know that as part of our 50th anniversary, we, we are launching a timeline of the American theater. And we've asked all of our members to submit information about your founding. We're going to put it in this amazing interactive online timeline that coincides with different kinds of events that were happening in the world at the time that your theater was founded. Um, we have gotten 300 responses. If you haven't responded and you're interested, let us know. Ruth Egelsayer is spearheading that effort. Um, please remember that there is, this is a second reminder, um, Spotlight On, a uh, reception to meet all of TCG's grantees, designers, actors, mentees. It's at 5.30. It's a reception. You can also see the work of, uh, of these great artists and administrators. Um, and that is in the gold, yes, in the gold room. Okay, the gold, the gold ballroom. Wherever the, the lounge, the TCG lounge, the TCG lounge. Um, the, I know, I know, I know. Yeah? The go what? Emerald. Emerald room. Oh, oh. All right, thank you. She got through to me finally. It's like. Um, Town hall meetings. Um, we in the artist in the artist session, and thank you to Mark Chagall for his research again, and to Angel for moderating that panel, which was wonderful, and all the panelists. Um, we are going to continue the town hall meeting effort over the course of the next years. We hope that will become a regular thing, um, and we hope your theater will consider holding a town hall meeting in the coming year. We'll send out information, um, but please let me know if you specifically are interested in participating in that effort. And last but not least, tomorrow morning. We meet again at 9 a.m., 9 a.m., and we're meeting at the Performing Arts High School. I do not have the address here. It's in your materials, but I just want you to keep in mind that it is about a 20-minute walk from here. It is walkable. You go up the hill that you went up last night. Good exercise in the morning. And um, the high school is just about, it's past where the, the music center is, where we were last night. Okay, that's it. You're dismissed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>